it's always a question within historical interpretation of of looking at everything and not just coming up with a an, a, an environmentally determinist scenario. Hi. I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at AcademicInfluence.com and Wake Forest University. Today we have a guest coming all the way from England, Professor Clive Oppenheimer at Cambridge University. And Professor Oppenheimer, I'm curious, as a volcanologist, how does your work impact our knowledge and study of global warming and climate change? One of the ways that it, it is relevant is because volcanoes are one of the main ways that uh, main causes of natural variability of climate on Earth. Uh, we see this with very large eruptions, particularly large explosive eruptions that emit a lot of sulfur gas into the stratosphere. This ends up forming little particles that reflect some sunlight back into space and lead to a cooling at the Earth's surface. And so when we look at climate today, when we look at the climate of the past, uh, we need to factor in volcanic eruptions uh, as one of the key uh, sources of variability. And um, one of the outcomes of that is that uh, we can compare climate model outputs with observations. And uh, this becomes a very powerful way to understand how well climate models are working, uh, because if you cannot match the two, if you can't, if your models are not reproducing the climate change uh, that you're observing, then you know that there's some process that you're still not understanding. Um, there's a kind of spin-off here as well, I, I think, relevant to ideas of geoengineering, and particularly the kind of geoengineering uh, that's called solar resource management. Um, this is an idea to combat global warming by effectively recreating what volcanoes do naturally. Uh, and again, I think what we've understood from studies of volcanic eruptions of the past, this gives us some idea, uh, not only you know, whether this would work or not, uh, but also whether or not it could be a bad idea. Well, do you think it might be a bad idea? It seems like whenever humans try to get in and muck up the system, it uh, doesn't always go like we planned. Uh, yeah, no, we've got a, a pretty good track record, I think, for messing up. Uh, and uh, yes, it, I, I think the, I mean, now now we're we're kind of into the realm of, of adaptation, you know, in, in some ways, whether we like it or not. Um, but I, I'm not convinced about the, the, this whole idea of stratospheric uh, geoengineering because, I mean, we know from volcanic eruptions that uh, there can be unwanted, there could be unwanted side effects. So uh, one of them is suppression of precipitation. Mm. Uh, okay, there might be parts of the world where you could do with a bit less rain, but uh, in many parts of the world, uh, for example, in, in Asia, where there's huge reliance on the Asian monsoon for uh, for rice production, uh, this is something you don't you don't want to mess with uh, without you know real understanding of what the consequences could be. Yes, and it seems like once you've started this type of geoengineering, there's no turning back. It's not like you can turn off the switch and make everything back to normal. So, so you'd very much recommend not trying this, uh, at least in the near future. I, I wouldn't pontificate on the subject beyond what I've said already, which is, uh, uh, I mean, my, my voice is not going to make any difference on this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's beyond my, my real expertise. So I, I don't have a real comment beyond that okay. as to whether it's a good idea or not. Well, well I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> it just <laughs> seems, seems like something we're not quite ready for yet. Now, you, you've uh, studied not only what's happening in volcanoes today, but also in the past. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the um, sort of social changes that you've researched and, and found out about that have been due to eruptions and the changes in, in climate in the past. So it's a very interesting area, and effectively what you're doing is, is history and interpreting history. And uh, one of the main things I've discovered is, is doing history is really taking evidence and coming up with the most rational explanation for events that you can. You can never really prove anything. Uh, and we can think of even recent examples in, in modern times. If we, I'll give you an example, the, uh, the, the food crisis in, in 2008. Uh, has been argued as a trigger for the for the Arab Spring. Okay, I mean you can you can make arguments why this is rational, um, but you can't prove it. So if we go even further back in time and say this volcanic eruption led to um, 
uh, the big demographic change in, in Europe, people migrating to the Americas, people migrating from east to west across North America. Uh, you really need to put this in a, in a much wider historical context of what's going on socially, economically, politically. Um, I think one of the best examples is the 1815 eruption of Tambora, a volcano in Indonesia, one of the largest eruptions in history. And uh, this put so much sulfur into the atmosphere, it, it did have a profound impact on climate. Uh, we do have um, hard economic data for grain prices in, in Europe, in North America, and we can see that these go up quite dramatically in the few years after the eruption. Uh, and there's a whole chain of, of, of events, riots, uh, for example, very close in, in my hometown in Cambridge, uh, and uh, all sorts of other things going on in, in the world. But we have to look at, look at that in the context of the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. So it's always a question within historical interpretation of, of looking at everything and not just coming up with a, an, a, an environmentally determinist scenario. Have there been changes uh, nowadays that are already due to changing climate? So we've seen temperatures rising. Are there any specific uh, social changes that you've seen? Sorry, do you mean related to volcanoes? Or? Well, not so much volcanoes, because I'm not sure how much uh, the current pattern of warming is due to volcanoes. It seems like volcanoes cause a cooling. So this would be, no, just more in general, sort of the, the general weather pattern that we've seen over the last 20 years. Has it led to any kind of social change? Crumbs. I mean, the, the last 20 years uh, has it seems like uh, the last 200 or the last 1,000, uh, lots and lots of conflict, mm -hmm. uh, lots and lots of uh, political turmoil. Uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't say it's been a great 20 years in, in many respects. Uh, you know, the, the, the bigger picture, we, we can look at, uh, for example, um, tree rings. Tree rings are, are one of the best proxies that we have for past climatic variability. Uh, going back for certainly a couple of thousand years and potentially further back in time. And the importance of tree rings is that they can be precisely dated uh, with annual uh, accuracy. And by collating data from a wide area, from parts of North America, Eurasia, uh, you can build up a, a broader climatological pattern. And, and we see back in history, you know, there have been warmer periods, there have been cooler periods, Little Ice Age being one of them. And uh, in the broad sweep of history, you might start to say, well, you know, these are times of comparative prosperity. These are times of greater uh, political unrest and, uh, and turbulence uh, and how these might correlate with, with climatic factors. Uh, but I, you know, in some ways, I don't, I don't see great differences in the last 20 years, except, of course, that we are now the engineers of the climatic change. And, and that in itself has brought about a lot of conflict between the people who say we need to stop doing what we're doing, the people say who say we can keep doing what we're doing. So in that sense, maybe it's brought about uh, a bit of social upheaval, but not in the typical sense that you've studied in history. So that's interesting. Now, as, as a researcher, where do you see your career and your studies going from this point forward? You mentioned the two areas that you're most involved in, but where would you like to apply your efforts moving towards the end of your career? Well, uh, I've become a filmmaker uh, in the last few years, so I'm putting a lot of my energy into that and into writing. Uh, so um, I want to keep the, of course, keep the science ticking over, and a lot of that is done by uh, very talented grad students and postdocs. Uh, so I, I, I'll ride on their coattails a little bit if I can. But uh, yeah, I, I certainly hope to throw more of my energies into uh, into filmmaking. You know, mm -hmm. which, which I guess is is maybe more about public engagement. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your filmmaking. How did it get started, and what have you done with it? Uh, I've made a couple of films with uh, with Werner Herzog, who's a, a somewhat better filmmaker than I am. Uh, we met when he was making a film in Antarctica, where I I had uh, worked for a number of years on a volcano called Erebus. Um, that was back in two thousand six. And we kept in touch. I had uh, 
always entertained the idea of making a documentary in volcanoes. And ultimately, I persuaded Werner to make that with me. So we made a film, Into the Inferno, uh, for Netflix four years ago. And uh, on the back of that, I wanted to make an, another film uh, and had a number of ideas. But the one, the one that uh, got some traction was to make a film also on a geoscience topic, but beyond my particular expertise, but looking at uh, everything to do with meteorites, uh, shooting stars. Um, and it, it, this, this both topics bring in what, what we've been discussing, the, uh, the entanglements between nature and culture. You know, these are phenomena, if we think about meteorites, um, these have been venerated. Uh, the, the black stone in the Kaaba in the Grand Mosque in Mecca is probably a mete meteorite. Um, this is one of the holiest, holiest relics in Islam. Um, so that's that's what we've been doing with these two films. And uh, what, what excites me about that and motivates me is not to make a very didactic film, uh, but much more, um, I'd say, you know, at a more philo philosophical and uh, an artistic and cinematic level uh, to, to take these topics and look at the possibilities for uh, working out a narrative. And does your writing go along with your filmmaking or is it on separate topics and uh, not connected? Uh, it's, it's loosely interconnected, I'd say. I mean, the first film came off the back of... Uh, a book that I wrote on large eruptions. And, uh, you know, I would say it was inspired by the book. It's not based on the book, but it, it certainly uh, draws on some of those themes. Um, I think, I think actually one of the things I found lately, having made a couple of films is that, uh, filmmaking is informing the way I write. I now, I now think more in terms of, uh, storytelling and narrative structure, uh, when I write. And I think that's something uh, you know, there definitely, you know, there is, is an interface between filmmaking and writing. Mm -hmm. And for any budding filmmakers or authors, uh, what would you say you learned about storytelling? What, what are the key points to know when you're trying to tell a story? I think one of the key points is, um, it, you know, as far as possible, don't, don't be pushed into, into doing something in a particular format. Uh, and I, I think, you know, in, in, in many ways, um, you know, what, what I've done, I don't have a background in fine arts. I've never trained in, in filmmaking. Um, but, uh, you know, we all, we all watch movies. You know, we all formulate an opinion of something we've just watched immediately. Uh, we, we're, we're trained in, in cinema, you know, just through having experienced so much of it. Uh, so I think, you know, take, take what you like from that uh, and, and adapt. In, t in terms of storytelling, um, I think it's it's often not going for the obvious. Uh, is one of the reasons I wanted to make a film about volcanoes is that uh, all the documentaries or most of the documentaries I've ever seen are um, uh, very very similar. Uh, usually the doom and gloom scenario, but you know, I, knowing the subject, I know that they miss a lot of the nuances and the really exciting uh, research that's going on. So, with your documentary on volcanoes. What routes did you take that were sort of unexpected and lead to people enjoying it on Netflix? Um, I, I had a number of, uh, I suppose, um, guiding principles. One, I, I didn't really want to uh, stick to conventional narratives. I didn't want to go to places that everybody knew already, uh, Hawaii or um, Pompeii. So I wanted to... Um, go to some more unusual places. So we filmed in North Korea. In fact, that was the first place we started filming. Uh, we filmed in Ethiopia, in Vanuatu, uh, Indonesia, and Iceland. Uh, I also uh, wanted to weave in my own research. Uh, so all the places we went pretty much were places that I've, I've had uh, research over a number of years working with, uh, collaborating with people in those countries. Um, and I wanted to, to look uh, not so much at the scientific side of things, but the more anthropological and, and very much this nexus between human society and culture and natural phenomena. And, you know, in the case of volcanoes, very, very awesome phenomena. So, you know, one of the things you discover is 
that for a, a tribal chief living on the side of a volcano in Vanuatu, um, who hasn't been to university and studied geology, well, okay, he has a very different uh, explanation for volcanic phenomena. But in you know, in, in many ways, it's every bit as valid as my my explanation based on uh, you know just the scientific arguments. Uh, so that that um, you know that that was part of the narrative. I think this this sort of human how the human imagination has dealt with volcanism. Uh, since our earliest days. Hmm. Well, it's just fascinating. It definitely m- wants, uh, makes me want to go watch the movie that you made and look for other ones that you make in the future. So thank you so much, Professor Oppenheimer, for coming on this program today and for sharing all these interesting things. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Chad. Thanks for having me on.